Halloween, the original 1978 version, directed by John Carpenter and starring Jamie Lee Curtis and Donald Pleasence, both of whom have very strong performances in this movie. And this film, out of all the horror movies, has the best music and soundtrack out of all the serial killers. Michael Myers gets the top killer soundtrack. Gives you that unsolved mysteries type vibe. You may be able to help solve a mystery. I'm going to get right into spoilers on this film. I'll unpack my critiques and strong points of it as I go through my breakdown and synopsis and at the end of the review, as well as to why I feel how I feel about this film. I'm sure if you clicked this video, you've seen the original Halloween, but in case you haven't because you're like Patrick Starr under a rock, here is your five second spoiler warning. <laughs> Through the lens of a six-year-old Michael Myers is how the movie begins. He watches his sister's boyfriend leave the house and slowly makes his way up to a room and starts stabbing her with a knife. And to me, it's an incredibly funny scene to someone like me who's seen very violent, gory movies. Ah! Ah! Kill me! Because the acting and the motion of the stabbing is very stiff looking and it's very humorous in a way. Doesn't feel like it's a true authentic Real life stabbing. But to audiences in 1978, it might have been the most graphic, horrifying thing they ever saw. Judith dies only after a few stabs, and I'm calling BS. I don't see any vitals penetrated, and I've watched enough forensic files to know if you're not a trained killer, you're not going to pull off a very quick killing. Unless you're an assassin, and you just kick ass and you kill for a living. I will find you. And I will kill you. He wanders outside with his bloody knife in his hand, and his parents come and rip off the clown mask he had on. Right away we know he's a depraved lunatic of a child. Fast forward, now it's 1978, and Myers is 21. Smith's Grove, Illinois is where the killer is being held up in a facility. Dr. Sam Lewis is in the car with a nurse, Marion, and mentions to her it's been 15 years since Myers has spoken a word, given the cold shoulder silent treatment from his patient there. They are going to the facility to have him go before a judge for a hearing on what his future sentencing will look like. They are driving along, approach the main gate, and there are just patients milling around all over the fucking place. Obviously, security protocol is dismal and quite pathetic at this institution. Can I go through here? Just be back by bedtime. Okay. And one of the crazies jumps on the car and grabs Marion by the driver's side. And this crazed patient is Michael Myers. And he drives off with the car. This is a plot point problem I have with this movie. Was Michael Myers the killer child when he was admitted taking driver's ed during his stay? Because he sure looks like he knows his way behind the wheel. He just takes off in the car like Grand Theft Auto is his side hustle. This is definitely a flaw in the movie and it's a critique that I have and always will of this movie. Unless there was Mrs. Puff's boating school there helping Michael along. You only need three more I hope I still remember how to do this. Yeah. Dr. Lewis even jokes about this in the movie shortly after. Not about Mrs. Puff, but about Michael driving off. Haddonfield on Halloween, 1978. Laurie Strode is walking to school, and her father, who is a real estate agent, tells her to drop a key off to the Myers house. There is a family interested in the home, and I wonder if the realtor might bring up the fact that a girl got stabbed and killed there by her younger brother. While she's walking the key over, this kid that she babysits, Tommy, walks with her to the house, and we see the point of view from inside the house when she's on the front porch, and Michael Myers is lurking through the other side of the door, and we get a first person view to see him stalk Lori and listen to his heavy breathing. Maybe he was just working out or he's having difficulty breathing behind the mask. And all of us know post 2020, there can be some difficulty breathing behind a mask. Dr. Loomis is at the facility and proceeds to give this guy an earful on the whole situation, the facility not being secure enough. The guy just brushes off how he's not responsible, and Loomis presumes Michael is going back to Haddonfield, and again, this mustache man says it's 150 miles away, and he doesn't know how to drive. Ugh. 
You would be wrong there, sir. Sam is basically like, yeah, you weren't seeing him completely operate the whip last night. Sam Haddonfield is 150 miles away from here now. Now, for God's sakes, he can't drive a car. He was doing very well last night. Maybe someone around here gave him lessons. Here's your license. My license? It tastes just like I dreamt it would. Lori is sitting in class and looks out the window and sees this freak out there from the other side of the road just staring her down with the hijacked car and she answers a question from a teacher for a few moments and then goes to look back out and Michael has already hightailed it out of there. Michael Myers has this ability where he's never rushing or moving urgently. But if you look away for a brief moment, there is zero trace of him. And I believe Michael can go invisible or he can stop time from moving at the very least. Now Michael is trespassing on school grounds and actually catches a kid who is about to run into him. He's now stalking Tommy and gets back in his car and look at him handle that steering wheel and slow down, then speed off. If Mrs. Puff did teach him, she did very well. Loomis is on the phone in the middle of Bumblefuck and telling a police officer that Myers is coming back to Haddonfield. And it doesn't go well because he ends the call with, I'm his doctor, you must be ready for him. If you don't, it's your funeral. Sam goes over to this red truck that's off to the side of the train tracks and sees these white sheets that were Michael's gown and sees this red card for the rabbit in red lounge that was inside the car that Marion and Loomis were in on their way to the insane asylum facility. And as Sam runs back to his car, we see a dead guy in the brush, Michael's first victim. Lori walks back with two of her girlfriends, Linda and Annie, and right on cue, around the corner, Myers is creeping. Moments later, he is waiting in the shrubs for them, and Annie aggressively goes up to confront him. But of course, Michael isn't there. And what's just so fascinating about it is that this guy's wearing a mask and doing all this stalking in broad daylight. I'm telling you, he has teleportation tactics that he uses. Lori, not paying attention, walking, thinking of Myers, bumps into Mr. Brackett, who is a cop and is Annie's father as well. Lori makes it back home and looks out the window, and there he is, behind hanging laundry, and I have a problem with this scene because all of a sudden he's there, and then all of a sudden he's not. And we don't get a frame where Lori is looking away or a cut scene of her daydreaming, thus reinforcing my theory that Michael Myers has the ability to freeze time and or become invisible. This part here is just totally unexplainable to me. Annie then calls Lori and says she's picking her up at 6.30. Annie comes and they smoke some pot. In the meantime, Dr. Loomis is walking about this graveyard with this gravekeeper and they come to discover that Judith Myers' headstone is missing. Judith, of course, being Myers' sister that he killed. Annie and Lori are driving along and roll up on Mr. Brackett and he tells them that Somebody broke into the hardware store, probably kids. You blame everything on kids. Well, now all they took was some Halloween mask, a rope, and a couple of knives. Who do you think it was? Now, who could that possibly be? Dr. Lewis arrives right after they pull away and says he wants to have a word with them, but... We never see that word that Dr. Loomis and Brackett have. But in the background, you can see Michael whipping around the corner. The perfect driver who never operated the vehicle before hasn't missed the beat, obviously. Instead, we get Annie and Lori in the car smoking weed and gossiping and Michael following them in the car behind them. He pulls up, parks, gets out, and just stands there and sees Annie go in the house where she's babysitting for the night. The parents don't notice Michael as they walk out and, oh, by the way, I know it's Halloween, but if you saw a grown man like that, even on Halloween night, standing in the road outside of your house, it's time either to get your shotgun, if you have one, call the police, or at least say something to the guy and ask, what's up? Another reason for you to believe me and get on board with my claim of his ability to use invisibility. Sam and Officer Brackett pull up to the Myers house, go inside and investigate, and they find the remains of a dog that has been eaten. He got hungry. You don't get to see that on camera, and it's not shown, and thank God it's not. Dr. Loomis describes to Officer Brackett his counseling of Michael when he was a boy, and he gets very descriptive of how he just seemed lifeless and evil. I met this six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face and the blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. I spent eight years trying to reach him, and then another seven trying to keep him locked up because I realized that what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. 
Bracket asks what they should do, and Sam says he's already been here tonight, and that he shall wait for him. Dr. Loomis, I will give you that. You are a brave man with brass balls. And advises Bracket to tell fellow officers to keep their mouths shut and eyes open. Bracket tells Sam that he'll check back in an hour. Lori is babysitting and giving a pretty good effort, willing to read to the child and talk to him. She's a better babysitter than Vicky from Fairly Odd Parents. Annie calls, and we see the family German Shepherd dog that she's babysitting for. And Michael is outside, so Annie and Lori are on the phone gossiping about some guy, and Tommy looks out the window and sees Michael's silhouette just standing there, looking in her direction. He's always watching this fuck. He's looking right at her, and she doesn't notice him? I'm sorry. To keep bringing it up, but John Carpenter gave him invisibility. I'm telling you, he's not just a villain. He's a supervillain. And he spills on her shirt butter for the popcorn. After the spill on her shirt, she gets completely undressed in the kitchen. Total overreaction. Just wipe yourself down and call it a day. And she puts a dress shirt on that's not hers. And let me just have a scene breakdown right here. Imagine if the parents of the child she's watching came in the kitchen right now. She's wearing the shirt of the man of the house, and she doesn't have pants on as well. The wife might just knock her out. He rips a potted plant down, apparently he's a killer of potted plants too, and the dog confronts Michael outside the window and starts barking, and Annie gets annoyed, and then you hear the dog whimper, and Michael strangled the dog, and I'm somebody who loves dogs, and if you are somebody too, you're really hoping this sick fuck gets taken down now. Annie goes to do laundry, washing that shirt and pants of hers is a high priority, obviously. And Michael is just standing there outside the door. And cue the eerie music. And Annie thinks she sees somebody and goes to look. And obviously he's not there. Then the door mysteriously closes. And the girl that she's babysitting for, Lindsay, is now all by herself. And her love interest calls, and it comes to let her out because Annie locked herself in there. She's on the phone gossiping right in the background. There he stands. Are gone. Oh, that's fabulous. When did they leave? About a half hour ago. Oh, utterly fantastic. <laughs> After Annie shuts her trap and goes to sit in with Lindsay, she tells her that they are going to pick up Paul and that she'll drop her off across the street with Tommy Doyle. And clearly Lindsay has the hots for him because she's totally into going over to see him and watch TV together. Michael is creeping right behind the car when they make their way over there to the Doyle's house. Lori and Annie link up. Then Annie leaves and heads back to the house to get in the car to get to her boyfriend, and it's locked. So she goes back to the house for the keys and opens the door without even putting the keys back in, and she sits down, and she can sense that something isn't right. And also that there's fog on the inside of the windshield, so she's not alone. Michael is in the back seat and grabs her from behind and starts choking her and then slits her throat. That's how Annie sadly passes. If you were closely paying attention, she's able to open the door without putting the keys in. So obviously someone had to have opened the door and is waiting for her. And that somebody was Michael. Then Tommy looks out the window across the street and sees Michael carrying Annie's body back into the house. Lori comes in the room right after he starts freaking out and she completely dismisses him and says there's nobody out there. So she's basically saying, yeah, Tommy, you're a mental case. I'm ready to go in, coach. Just give me a chance. Loomis is waiting behind the bushes next to Michael's childhood home. And some kids come up and they start the whole, you're too chicken to go inside. And which, by the way, that is not an insult to be called a chicken. That's a tough motherfucking bird. Go on and get him. Get him, get him, get him. Come on, what's the matter with you? Get him. Pick him up. Put him up. Pick him up. Put him up. Are you standing still or something? Feet, feet. <laughs> And Sam says some creepy shit to them. Hey. Hey, Lonnie. Get your ass away from there. And they scurry off like roaches. Officer Brackett comes and tells Loomis that he thinks he's way off on his prediction. And Sam sticks to his guns that Myers has come back to wreak havoc. I watched him for 15 years. Sitting in a room. Staring at a wall. Not seeing the wall. Looking past the wall. Looking at this night in humanly patient. Waiting for some secret, silent alarm to trigger him off. Death has come to your little town, Sheriff. And Officer Brackett ends with his conversation with some strong, somber words to Sam. All right, I'll stay with you tonight. Just in the chance that you're right. And if you are right, damn you for letting him go. 
Linda and Bob pull up and they are very intoxicated. And the plan that's been arranged is that Annie cleared the house of Lindsay so Linda and Bob could come and have sex in the house and presumably her as well with her boyfriend when she came back with him. But we know that's not a possibility anymore because because Annie's dead. Linda and Bob are getting it on, on the couch, and you can see as the screenshot winds out, Michael just standing there watching the show. Linda calls over to the house Lori is at and tells her that Annie isn't in the house. And Lori just says, her and Paul probably pulled over and stopped off somewhere, thinking, hey, the girl is probably getting laid. Yeah, no, she's dead. So Bob and Linda go up to the bedroom and there's just clothes and beer cans all over the floor. They didn't walk in on that. It's all because of Bob and Linda. I better hope they drank all that beer. Otherwise, it's going to spill all over the carpet. And the Wallaces, which are Lindsay's parents, must really love Halloween. They got a fucking jack-o'-lantern in the goddamn bedroom. So they're making out in the bedroom, about to make sweet love. I'm gonna make love to you, woman. Gonna lay you down by the fire. Phone rings and they just take it off the hook. When you're aroused, you don't want to be bothered with phone calls. This is Howard Wallowitz. And this is Christy Vanderbilt. We can't get to the phone right now because we're having sex. <laughs> <laughs> Linda makes the point to Paul, we're not supposed to be here. So if it's the homeowners of this place, they're going to be like, what the fuck are you people doing here? They continue to engage in sexual activity. And we see Michael's silhouette looming about. Linda tells him to get her a beer and he gets right up to do so. Bob heads to the kitchen to get beers, and the door nearby cracks open mysteriously because Invisible Man is why. Or there's a ghost in this Halloween movie that's also aiding Michael. And he hears heavy breathing. Bob opens a door, and Michael comes bursting out and just picks him up off the ground with one hand like it's nothing and stabs him in the chest hard and deep enough to where this guy is now suspended in air. And I will admit, this is a crazy, creepy horror scene where Michael is just watching this guy hanging there and tilting his head back and forth. Movies like The Purge definitely had to borrow that sort of unsettling type of horror suspense moment from this movie. It is for sure one of the most creepy and memorable horror scenes in all of horror cinematography, this scene. So Michael goes back up to the bedroom where Linda's at and just stands in the doorway with a bedsheet over himself. Quite the great disguise, I think, with the glasses over the sheet as well, <laughs> trying to pretend he's Bob. He really pulls that off. And Linda starts getting annoyed because she really wants her beer. So in her impatience, she decides to get up to call Lori to see what's going on with Annie and Paul. With her back turned, Michael decides to come up from behind her and choke her with the phone cord while the call is going through and Lori answers while Linda's getting choked to death, which is pretty funny and disturbing that pleasure sex noises and getting the life choked out of you are similar in nature. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's kind of humorous after Michael kills her that he just holds the phone up to his face. Very similar to when Patrick got annoyed about answering the phone at the Krusty Krab. Lori decides to call right after just to make sure it wasn't a prank. And from that action, you can tell she's unsettled and has her antenna up as to something isn't okay. I thought she was a good babysitter up to this point. But she goes to check the kids. She looks in and Lindsay and Tommy are in the same bed together? What the fuck? Are you mad? I know they're very young, and sexual intercourse amongst individuals of their age is most likely not on the table yet, but I'm sorry. It's too close for comfort. Lewis is still chilling by the bush, and he looks over and sees the car that Michael hijacked, and sees the official use-only emblem on the side, so he knows for certain that he's here. Come on, Doc. You're just seeing this now? Were you jerking off behind the bushes the whole time, facing the other way. What makes this part of the movie perplexing is that Officer Brackett had been with Dr. Loomis several times since Michael parked this car. When they go back to Michael's childhood home and find the dog remains, and the scene where Brackett tells him he thinks all of this is way off, so neither of them didn't notice or look for this vehicle. And Sam didn't tell him a description of it or tell him about it. I'd say they are very incapable. Lori decides, you know what? I'm going to abandon my post and just go over to see if Annie's back and check on if Paul and Linda are okay. Lori enters the house from a side door, from one that mysteriously opened when Paul was near it. She hears something move and she's not hearing anyone say anything, so she's nervous, and rightfully so. In this moment, 
why not go back to the Doyle's house, lock the doors, and call 911 instead of playing hero? But I guess she's thinking, I don't want to call the cops and have a scene over there. And plus the cops would say, hey, teenagers go missing and they take off all the time. Plus Lindsay's parents, the Wallaces, might come home and everyone gets in trouble. So, all right, I give you a pass, Lori, on this. But it's just something to think about if you were truly, truly terrified. Lori makes her way up to the bedroom and finds Annie there on the bed with Judith Myers' tombstone above her. Quite a sight. That is your dead friend with a serial killer's murdered sister's tombstone over her. She backs up behind a doorway and Bob's body comes swaying down after she bangs into the wall. What the hell is holding Bob up? Did Michael tie his legs up and pin him to the ceiling or doorway? So she, Lori, essentially jars him free when she backed up into the wall. Then a closet door opens, revealing Linda's body. And I know this is nitpicking type shit, but these kind of things do matter and add up in movies. Just watch and notice how this door, like many other times in this movie, just come opening on its own. At least right before with Bob, Lori in this part does bang into the door and then Bob comes flying down. But this part with Linda's dead body reveal, there's six seconds in between her bumping into the door and it coming open. And it's not because Linda's body slumped forward. She's propped up in the back and you can clearly see that her arms aren't even pressed up against the door. When you analyze the Bob dead body reveal, the physics were appropriate and made logical sense. Whereas in this case, the door just flies open on its own, magically, as if someone were there with a string pulling it open. Which again, there might be this ghost or Michael's invisibility cloaking mechanism. I'm just saying, I know you're thinking I'm out overanalyzing this too much, and I very well might be, but I'm a very passionate movie critic and reviewer. Lori now comes out of the room all distraught, and this is one of the best moments. Michael in the doorway, slowly fading into the frame, becoming more and more visible. Again, it's one of the best moments in horror cinematography. And it's a very scary and thrilling part of the movie. It definitely gives you a good rush of horror dopamine. Michael stamps her in the upper arm, and Lori goes flying over the banister. Myers starts making his way downstairs. She goes to the kitchen and locks the door. Which, by the way, who has a lock on their kitchen door? What the fuck is going on in that kitchen? Lori tries to get out, but Michael propped the door shut with a rake. And he is a serial killer freak, and he is able to punch a hole in the door and unlock it from the outside. So Michael is a strategic serial killer, too, being able to trap you with a rake. He starts walking towards her. She breaks the glass and she opens the door and takes off and starts screaming, knocks on a door to the house next door. And they look out the window and they draw the blinds. Fuck you, basically, is what they're saying. You're on your own. Lori lost the key to the Doyle's house in her scrum, presumably with Michael. And she looks across the street and he's on his way to finish the job. And Lori's banging on the door, asking for Tommy to open it. And he's taking his sweet ass time. Not a whole lot of urgency. She's able to get inside and picks up the phone, and there's no dial tone, so she just tosses the phone. She sees there's an open window, and you could hear Michael's heavy breathing again, and she's crouched in front of the couch, and Michael comes out and tries to stab her. She sticks him in the neck with a yarn pin. This is another part of this movie that's just inconsistent and doesn't add up. For someone like me that analyzes very closely, Michael is somehow able to get in behind the couch when Lori gets in the Doyle's house in the nick of time and she uses the phone right away and doesn't leave the room. She lets go of the phone and goes to the other side of the couch. But he just magically is able to show up in there. In order for him to get behind that couch, she would have heard him and saw him. Someone that is a pretty decently sized person like Michael Myers is not getting through a little crack in a window and you not being able to see or hear it. There's absolutely no chance. And it's not like minutes go by. It literally happens seconds after she gets in. So Michael plucks the yarn pin from his neck and collapses. And you know damn well right there that he's not dead or even close to it. And Lori for some reason thinks it is and drops the knife. How about going over to that fuck and going full psycho on his ass and slice and dice that fucking bitch up? Loomis is just strolling through the streets when Officer Brackett pulls up and lets him know that Michael is here and he found the car and tells him to get going and that he'll wash the front of the house and you wash the back. Lori makes her way upstairs and Lindsay and Tommy open the door and she tells them that she's killed the boogeyman. Yeah, not so fast. You see Michael in the back walking up the stairs. <laughs> The kids lock themselves in the bathroom and Lori goes in a closet, which to me is 
so dumb. She should have threw the kids off the second floor, and then she jumped down after that. When you have a knife-wielding lunatic after you, that doesn't seem like a bad option at all. So Lori ties the door shut from the inside and slumps over in the corner, cowering in fear, and Michael obviously finds her and starts shaking the door, and basically is like, okay, enough of that, and punches it down. And she has great aim. Lori stabs him in the eye with a coat hanger. Michael drops the knife and she stabs him with it. And he goes down. Now again, here you have an opportunity to stab and mutilate this fuck and really put an end to it. Instead, she walks over to the kids. The kids will be there after you butcher them, but no. And tells them to go to the Mackenzie's house down the street. We don't know who the Mackenzie's are, she's just saying go to their house. So, okay. The kids are going to the Mackenzie's. Some family she must know well enough that won't close the blinds on them if they mention their name. So Lori's sitting there thinking it's all over, and Michael sits up, and right after the kids come out screaming of the house, Loomis is like, he must be there. And Michael comes up right behind her, like how he normally does, and tries to strangle her, and she rips off his mask, and we get to see what an ugly fuck he really is, and why he's wearing a mask. And Sam shoots him and heads to the doorway. He's standing right there. He's a horror villain, so he just got shot. It's like nothing happened. And Loomis comes over and fills him up with bullets. And Michael falls over the balcony. And there he lays. Lori asks Loomis, was that the boogeyman? And he says... Yes, it was. And he goes over to the balcony and there's no Michael. And the movie ends with all the different locations being shown where Michael was. And you hear the fucking heavy breathing the whole time. <laughs> the problems I have with this movie. Number one, we don't get to see the monumental moment where Michael gets the mask. That famous William Shatner face replica. John Carpenter should have showed the moment Michael breaks into the store and steals the mask and puts it on. This should have been a highly climactic moment that could have been added, but instead, as the audience, we get nothing on this front, which to me is a huge missed opportunity. The face mask is iconic, and in the Rob Zombie remake, we get that great moment where Michael goes back to his childhood home and rips up the floorboards and gets the mask out. We're also introduced to the mask immediately in the 2007 remake when he kills his sister Judith right away in the mask and it made me feel that he has a really deep connection with that mask. Whereas in this original version, it's just something that he stole from a store. So in the Rob Zombie remake, I feel like he had a stronger attachment and bond to that mask being that he had it even as a young child. In this original version, the mask comes as a far less powerful meaning as it did in the remake. Number two, the deaths in this movie are fairly lame and stiff and dull. The only one that's really entertaining or it gives you a what the fuck shock type moment is when he leaves Paul hanging like a wall decoration when he stabs him and the knife sticks to the wall. I will admit that's an incredibly memorable death scene and one of the best kills and moments in horror movie history, especially with Michael head tilting and looking at what he just done. Number three, Lori mysteriously losing sight of Michael when looking out of the window at the clothesline with the laundry hanging amongst him. The camera doesn't pan away. The director doesn't say to us, the audience, that Lori was daydreaming or she thought he was there, but he really wasn't. This might sound like... Again, nitpicking, but for a movie like this that a lot of folks hold in such high regard, it's warranting of even minute critiques. Number four, Michael driving a car when he was admitted as a young child. I think it's a fair assumption that while detained in a mental facility or a juvenile detention center that he wasn't getting driving lessons. The guy has zero driving experience whatsoever, but he's operating a car like a five-star rated Uber driver. Number five. Number five is circumstantial depending on what Halloween story line you're following but this movie is even worse in my eyes if you follow the new storyline of the Halloween movies. Halloween 2018 and Halloween Kills because if you do there is no family relation with Michael Myers and Laurie whatsoever. Whereas if you follow the original Halloween 2 from 1981 it's revealed that Lori is Michael Myers' sister, which is a storyline from Halloween that I really find captivating and enjoy the most, that Michael is obsessed with Lori because that's indeed his sister. To me, it makes it way more suspenseful and exciting that Michael and Lori share. It makes the bond and almost him wanting to kill her even more kind of sick and remarkable in a way. But again, a more powerful feeling with that storyline. So this talking point right here, again, it's a circumstantial one depending on what storyline you like or prefer. If you're following the new Halloween storyline, it doesn't make as much sense. Like, why is Michael obsessed with Lori? He just sees her sitting at 
her desk in class and he's like, you know what? I have to kill her and her friends. And it's not totally unbelievable because we are talking about a serial killer and some of them don't have a rhyme or reason for why they are or who they are killing. I just prefer the Rob Zombie storyline and the original Halloween 2 in 1981. Number six, doors mysteriously close and open and defy physics throughout the movie. It happens a lot and too often and it's like comical sometimes. Number seven, Lewis and Brackett not noticing the car that Michael stole and parked outside of the houses that Lori and Annie are babysitting. I mean, are they completely blind? They're like the blind mice from Shrek. Number eight, you don't get to see Michael in the psychiatric ward at any point in the movie. Another reason I like the Rob Zombie Halloween remake is that we get to see Loomis and Michael interact when Michael was a young child and the relationship that they had. In this version, you don't get any visual of that, not even a flashback. To me, this is another huge missing element of this movie. I really liked in Rob Zombie's version that for the first quarter of the movie, that is a huge integral part of the movie, Loomis and Michael's relationship and him trying to connect with Michael and you just seeing the young Michael Myers deteriorating more and more mentally. That was an aspect I really enjoyed about that one. Number nine, I've joked about this obviously throughout this review, Michael and his ability to become invisible, but here it's just beyond ridiculous it's when he gets in behind the couch just as Lori gets in the Donald's house in the nick of time and she uses the phone and she doesn't leave the room or look away for an extended period of time but he just magically shows up there. Michael is not a petite, thin, delicate footed woman and you're telling me he's slipping through that small crack in the window and making his way behind the couch without revealing himself or making any noise? Invisibility folks, sore time travel, I'm telling you. And number 10, we don't get to see Michael or the other mental patients as to how they were able to get out of their chambers or living quarters and start idly walking around the front gate of the facility. It's just another part of this movie that just irks me a bit that you don't get to see what happened. And again, it's just another lost opportunity, I feel. This might be a serious, unacceptable hot take to fans of this original Halloween movie, but to me, the Rob Zombie remake is a better Halloween movie. I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, I'd like to take this chance to apologize. To absolutely nobody! That's my stance and how I feel. There are many elements I think the remake does well that the original doesn't have. And the reasons I just mentioned. No scenes of Michael with Loomis as a boy is just a huge element this movie doesn't have. And the mask and no big reveal of it, of him putting it on for the first time. And in the Rob Zombie remake, no Michael driving around a car like he's a chauffeur. My final score for John Carpenter's 1978 Halloween. Can I get a drum roll, please? <laughs> A D. Now this might sound like an oxymoron, but this is an entertaining D, and I do recognize the significance of this movie. That does have a huge cult following, led to a franchise that will have produced 13 movies by the time it's all said and done. You have to respect that, and I do. It's a series I do enjoy. My grading scale for this movie is extremely high. Thank you for watching this movie review. If you enjoy this video, please, Hit that like and subscribe button down below, as well as the notification bell, so you are notified about the next Ryan Woolley review. I am Ryan Woolley, signing off, saying thank you, and hasta la vista.